Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Uncommon Sense. I'm Junia Doan, and I'm thrilled you're with us today. My guest is Dr. Patricia Yarbury Allen, a gynecologist and director of the New York Menopause Center. She is also a clinical assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Weill Cornell Medical College and an assistant attending obstetrician and gynecologist at New York Presbyterian Hospital. I was wondering how you selected medicine as a career. It was an accident. Um, I actually began to work in a hospital when I was almost 15, lying about my age, and I mean worked for a salary, uh, in the small town that I grew up in, southern Kentucky. And um, as I continued high school and then college, I worked full time. It took me seven years to complete college, but I was always working in a hospital taking care of patients and I was going to be a clinical psychologist, and I hoped to come to Stony Brook to get my PhD, not because it was especially famous, but because I liked the name. Yes, <laughs> it's a good way to choose things sometimes. When I was um, close to finishing my undergraduate work at the University of Louisville, my advisor suggested that I might want to consider becoming a psychiatrist. And in those days, there were no female role models for who were doctors. And I truly had never thought about becoming a doctor. So I said to him, uh, uh, don't I have to become a medical doctor? And he said, well, yes. And I said, how would I do that? And he said, there was an exam that was going to be given in six weeks and I should take it to see how I did. Um, so I made some rather amazing scores and I don't think I want to discuss those on television for everyone to hear, but uh, my math scores apparently are the worst in the Guinness Book of Records. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then I was interviewed and had to do all of my pre-med baccalaureate classes in, um, in 15 months and make all A's. And that's, that's a how, lot. That's how, I went, that's how I went to medical school. And what in medical school was the easiest for you to study? Well, the easiest thing for me was what I knew that my classmates did not know. I understood that I had a gift, and the gift was for patient relationships, uh, making patients comfortable, uh, and I was technically more skilled than my classmates because I'd already had 10 years of work in hospitals. Um, so my, at the end of my second year and my third and fourth years, I was in my real element. What does it take to make a patient comfortable? What did you do or not do? I think I know how to listen. I have a son who is now a neurology resident at Cornell, and that very smart man knows most of the answers, and I have tried to teach him that the most important thing that a doctor can do is to know how to ask the right questions, and also how to provide time and a comfortable space where the patient is allowed to sometimes wander. Often I find that when patients come to see a doctor, the reason they think they're coming is not always the reason. And only time allows the patient this uh, incredible gift of being comfortable and uh, telling the doctor what else is going on. I find that fascinating because what I've read is that Patients know, and you have only to ask them, and they will tell you what's wrong. But you're saying just that may be, but there is behind that that is closer to the truth. I think doctors have a lot of rote questions that they ask patients, and they run through those questions sometimes. Yeah. And the questions are quite wonderful, but they're meant to sort of, this is how we're going to introduce the conversation. And then the doctor needs to be quiet. Not ask for a yes or no, but give 15 seconds of peace for the patient to think. 
You know, how do you care for patients, but if they die or things go wrong, how do you live with the pain um, of that separation? Well, I've had great good fortune, Junia. Um, I haven't had patients who've died except, you know, they were older and they had something that could not be um, cured. Um, but no tragic accidents, thank you, God. That you know? is a lot to be thankful for. Every day, you know. And um, preventing medical errors is uh, something that a doctor has to be oh, so focused on all the time. Uh, when I talk to patients, for example, I'm not, uh, my staff are not allowed to interrupt me unless it's really, unless it's, is the office on fire? You know? <laughs> because I need to focus. And yes. I think that the distractions that all physicians and healthcare workers have are probably among the most dangerous issues that patients and healthcare face uh, in terms of errors. Just be focused, be calm, Stay, keep your mind on one patient and the one issue that, that is of interest. Why, why gynecology and obstetrics as a specialty? Well, I actually came to New York Presbyterian Hospital in 1976 to do urology. There weren't any female urologists, and that's exactly why I wanted to be the first. Um, so I did a year of general surgery, and um, I decided to become a gynecologist, and it's quite similar. Uh, reproductive medicine, surgery, general care of the patient, general care of the family, being part of a family over many decades. Um, one can do cancer surgery, um, mm -hmm. and um, in addition, there's um, you know just the excitement of delivering babies. So there are lots of things to do in that field. You must have had amazing stamina because babies come at all hours, I'm told. Uh, I stopped doing obstetrics in 2004, and not because I didn't want to continue. Uh, it was a, a problem of the malpractice had doubled, and my husband refused to allow me to continue to double the numbers of patients I was seeing. I was in solo obstetrics, which meant that um, I only missed six deliveries over the course of my long career. I loved OB because it was chaos, you know. Every woman who's pregnant, especially for the first time, thinks it's going to be quiet and romantic and painless. And um, of course, it is unpredictable. Yes. And obstetricians and labor, uh, labor personnel get into trouble when they become quiescent, when they think that everything is going to go smoothly. I had a famous mentor um, who's now at Stanford who said that the diagnosis of an uncomplicated pregnancy is only made at six weeks after the baby is born. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, wise, very wise. There are um, many things that have changed in medicine. Uh, births technologically more advanced, probably, and what I miss sometimes is the doctor-patient relationship that you were talking about earlier. Uh, the observation, the almost um, sort of energetic bond of understanding. And I really believe that if you care about your doctor, you get better faster. <laughs> you can handle things faster because you really feel that person is, uh, what do I want to say, is on your team. In your corner. Yes. Yes. And rare. Uh, not rare, but unusual. Actually not rare. Uh, not rare in my generation. I don't know how the new generation of doctors, most of whom will be employed by hospitals and large clinics, and they will be salaried professionals. I am hopeful, however, that the people who go into medicine go into medicine for the right reason, and that is because they find the, um, they find the work challenging, uh, they find uh, being a diagnostician exciting. Uh, they find the relationships that they can still develop with patients um, rewarding. Um, those are the only kinds of people who should go into medicine, except those who want to do research. What kind of a family did you come from? You said your father was a doctor? No, no, no. My father, my, the children's paternal grandfather was a physician. My father was a farmer, uh, and he went to, world, uh, went to war in World War II and came back with probable post-traumatic stress disorder. 
My mother was a teacher and um, we had a large farm with cows that had to be milked in the morning and in the evening, um, you know, acres and acres of tobacco and corn and all of those things. I went to a one-room school. Did you work the farm? You had daily responsibilities on the farm, right? Of course I had daily responsibilities. But I was largely, my responsibilities were more in the house. Uh -huh. You know, I helped my mother with housework, and I was the eldest of six, so I helped with my brothers and sisters. Um, but we all had gardening to do and canning and freezing. I mean, obviously not at the age of five, but... So did you uh, dominate in the family, being well, the I, oldest? Well, I hope my brothers and sisters don't see this, but yes. And how did you do that? Well, I'm a firstborn, you know, yes. so it always occurred to me that Mother belonged only to me, uh, yes. and uh, <laughs> it was useful for me, but not necessarily. The necessary. first one I understand that, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, and it was a uh, being a firstborn was useful for me from day one of school. In the the first day of my one room schoolhouse experience, uh, my teacher was probably twenty. Her name was Miss Shirley, and um, it was clear to me after a few minutes that Miss Shirley probably didn't know what she was doing. So I said to her when she wanted to pass out homework assignments, how could she do that? Because she didn't know what we knew, which only gave me an opportunity to show the entire school what I knew. And who taught you what you knew? My mother. My mother was a teacher, so I arrived um, at the age of four because they didn't know what to do with me, and um, you know I was already prepared to be a good student. The wonderful thing about a one-room school eight grades in one room, is that if a child wants to finish yes. the first grade, second grade, third grade, and fourth grade assignments, and then sort of meander through, right. it's quite possible to do what so. Did you, what did your mother teach you at home? Oh, my mother taught me to read and to write, to draw, you know, uh, and to memorize poems and poet and prayers. So you were pretty feisty, or so, at least that's what I'm hearing. Yes. And how, how did you uh, deal with uh, adults who may have wanted to direct you? Well, mentors were really uh, great for me. I would say that the course of my life was greatly improved by those who saw something in me to, who would give me a hand to the next part of my journey. Um, when we left the one-room school, I was in fifth grade. Um, and um, you know it was much more um, it was much more competitive in terms of social issues, and I was socially a fish out of water. I was, you know, audacious, smart, determined, uh, you know, and would uh, tell the teacher when she was wrong. These things were not well accepted in Southern Kentucky. And your mouth wasn't washed out with soap. No, but I was slapped once. For an impertinence? Yes. <laughs> That's really interesting. Your mother must have had a lot big challenge with you. I know. Well, no, she didn't. You know, my How mother was a teacher. You? My mother was a teacher in that school system. Oh. No, my mother always thought that I was just amazing. Isn't that wonderful? It is wonderful. Hmm. Now, you've taken an interest in women and women's issues. You yes. have a wonderful project. Would you say something about that? Well, I am one of the three founders of Women's Voices for Change. And in 2005, we gave a gala uh, with the North American Menopause Society to change the impression of the word menopause, which was all negative. Menopause yeah, really. meant death and loss. Uh, and we gave a fabulous, um, a fabulous party that was called by um, some people in the media as the menopause ball. It was uh, 400 women. We called it black tie, no tails. <laughs> and there were, there, were only were six, there were only six men there. And one of them was Vernon Jordan, who was allowed to choose, uh, draw a prize from a hat to give the women. Yeah. Um, so the purpose of that event was to have 400 accomplished, attractive women in New York City show up to become the voice and the face of the new menopause. This is what we looked like over 45. And um, it was a wonderful success financially. It gave us enough money to, in 2006, 
begin our website, which is uh, womensvoicesforchange.org. And we have uh, had two lunches since and have a board that support the organization. We are a 501c3 public charity. And um, we have uh, over 80,000 uh, page views a month, which is really quite wonderful. Oh, that is For impressive. only word, WOM word of mouth uh, marketing and advertising, we've had no budget for PR. So the purpose of the website was originally to just redefine the the definition of one word. You know, words are so important. Well, it was a bit more than the word. You were redefining the impression of the stage or the time of life. And that is you how it evolved. You were giving it vitality. That is how it evolved. Yes. And we believe and have worked hard throughout the past seven years to promote the idea that we are visible if we want to be. We do have power if we want to have. Uh, we, you know, we are beautiful, we're interesting, and we like each other, you know, so... Was that ever in doubt? Well, you know, there, I think in earlier decades, competition among women is, women is uh, much more common than it is when we are in the second half of life. I think we really appreciate our friends who are women. Relationships more. Yes in ways that we More may not have done before. More time to them, perhaps. Yes. So the site has lots of medical information, uh, and we do Fashion Friday, Poetry Sunday. Oh, what is Fashion Friday? Well, Fashion Friday is fun. Um, oh, I love fun. <laughs> yes. Fun is good. Yes, so we have, have... fun every day. Absolutely have fun every day. So Fashion Friday uh, is a short blog with lots of images around a theme, uh, the fall's theme has been neutrals and what to do with them. Obviously, <laughs> no, obviously women uh, will need to dress always for their figure and their body shape, but also there comes a time when, you know, wearing clothes that reveal too much are perhaps not the right thing to do. Um, and this summer we had a great series on Fashion Friday. We had... Um, uh, editors of beauty magazines who would write about how what they really liked doing in the summer and what their favorite fragrance was this year, what they served their guests unexpectedly, uh, what books they were reading. So, uh, What do you like to do in the summer? Well, you know, I work a great I deal. I was going to say, is there a summer <laughs> in your life? Well, first of all, I don't like to go into the sun. So that's good for my complexion. And um, uh, I, um, I visit friends. Uh, we have a home in Palm Beach, so I don't go there in the summer. But um, I read a lot, I exercise, and uh, I go to the opera in the, the summer season, the visiting opera houses. Um, so, uh, and I see my children. What does it take to be a good mom? What did you learn from your mom? What did you do differently? I did a lot differently. My mother was completely devoted to her children. Uh, so she didn't have a lot of time for self-care. Mm. And I knew that that was not going to be possible for me. So my right. mother came to live with me when I was 59 and my first child was two weeks old. And I went back to work uh, after the child was two weeks old. You were how old? Well, I was 30. The yeah. child was two weeks old, and my mother came to stay. So we co-parented for 17 years. And old style, in a way. An extraordinary yeah. time. Uh, mommy was so much fun and so generous, and there was never any turf war. She worked hard to make me appear to, that I was a better mother than I really was. What I really was was an anti-mame. You know, I like doing the really fun stuff although I was focused on education. and I was on the board of the Pearl Theater, which is a small theater for the classics here in New York, and I took the boys um, to see Ibsen, Chekhov, Shakespeare, and all of the Greek tragedies. They liked to ask their friends in front of me how many times they had seen Medea. <laughs> and, of course, they hadn't seen Medea. So uh, my sons would say, oh, well, 
Our mother took us to see Medea twice before we were 12, just right. to make sure we got it. Yes. <laughs> laughter is such an important part of teaching. How do you use laughter? Well, I laugh a lot in the clinic. I run the uh, women's clinic that is the, that's part of the Weill Cornell Community Clinic. The medical students at Weill Cornell have uh, created, financed, and managed this free clinic. Um, and I am the doctor who comes every two weeks from 5 p.m. till 10 p.m. And the medical students see patients first, women who have no insurance. Okay. And um, then I see the patient with them, examine the patient, and we do something called an assessment and then a plan. Before the doctors, before the medical students, especially the first year, who may never have been in the company of a patient before, is allowed to go into the room, I say to them, you're asking about humor, I say, how do you plan to introduce yourself? And the first years in the first three months of each year say something like, hello, my name is Emily. <laughs> and I say, no, your name is Miss Jones. You are not meeting the patient for a drink. Do you know? Mm -hmm. And because they have heard before that I'm a little eccentric, there is some humor in it. And we also talk about how they should be dressed because I remind them that these women are coming to see medical students because they have no other option for medical care. And it, it's important that they dress appropriately, that they, be, that they appear competent and confident. I tell them that if they dress it and act it, they, will, they have a better chance of being it, it being a healthcare professional. So uh, they don't know it before, is what you're saying? <laughs> no, the they, no, they really don't know it, and I don't know who's teaching it. But if I could have money for a project, I would love to do a little for boys and girls, excuse me, young men and young women in their first year of medical school. I would like to teach them how to talk, walk, and dress. You know, that generation, especially women, do speak with what we call uptalk. That is, they end their sentences on a question mark, which implies that they never know what the devil they're talking about. Yes, or so, they want you to agree with them, right? But whatever it is, it's not the kind of speech pattern that yes. is going to enable a female medical student to get into the kind of program that she really should be in. So it would be such fun working with uh, young men and women to help them appear to did be... You, did someone teach you that or did you just pick it up? Yes. Yes. No. What happened? 4-H. I love 4-H. So I was a fabulous 4-H competitor and they did teach us to walk. They taught us how to set a table. They taught us how you know to do basic cooking. Um, they allowed us to be models. We had to make our own clothes and then model them. We could sing and you know perform in musicals and you know I was quite the 4-H champion. Good for you. I think it's a wonderful program. <laughs> Not so evident in New York, but definitely no. evident in Michigan. Yes, and in Kentucky. And, and in Kentucky. Right. Yes. I'm, I'm very impressed with that uh, program. I, I love farm children anyway, because I feel they have a, they come out of it, even though it's drudgery, <laughs> they come out with a sense of work ethic that's My hard to get elsewise. My five brothers and sisters all have extraordinary work ethics, as did my mother's entire family and my father's family. You know, so that is never a problem. If there's a job to be done, my brothers and sisters know how to do it and they get it done right. Oh, I love that. I do too. Yes, I bet. Yes. Well, thank you. So this has been an interesting conversation. And one of the things I've learned is be true to yourself, but you have to be lucky to have a lot of energy and vitality and a willingness to speak the truth, at least where it's sometimes accepted. And also high personal standards and to take away opportunity from uh, where you are and the ability to get people to, I don't want to say help you, but believe in you. And um, that a, 
uh, supporting everything, our human relationships, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in family, whether it's in mentor, it's that ability to connect, to hear. You heard her said she turns off everybody, including the phones and her assistants, when she's with someone. She pauses and she listens and she advises that. This is something we could live in our lives. Talk less, listen more, or at least know what the other person might <laughs> be in a position to want to say. So I urge you uh, to take some of this into your life and to use it because all of us, all of us depend not only on ourselves but others. And what better thing is to take our abilities and make it better in life for people. So thank you for tuning in and remember do something kind for someone you know and someone you don't know today and do it tomorrow and the next day and thereafter. It will be a better world and I'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. To contact Junia, send her an email at info at juniadome.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadome.com. Thanks for joining us. See you next time for Uncommon Sense with Junia Doan. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.